thank you for your grace and truly your mercy, Lord. God, we thank you that you seem fit for us to be here today, and we're grateful for that, Lord. Yes. God, we thank you for another opportunity just to hear your word today, Lord. Yes, we thank you, Lord, and we praise you for who you are. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for giving us strength in our bodies today, God. Yes. God, we thank you for meeting all our needs, God. God, we give you praise and we give you glory and we give you honor this morning, Lord. God, we're praying that you will show up in our service today, Lord. We're praying that you will release the Holy Spirit. Even now, Lord, move by your spirit in this place, God. God, we thank you, we praise you, and we magnify your name. Let the church say amen in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. started this morning. So good to have all of you with us. Amen today. All right. The mic is sounding especially good today. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. We are so glad to have you in God's house today. Um, I'm expecting a great time in the Lord. Good to see all of your lovely faces here in the sanctuary. Good to have uh, Sister Diane Smith back with us today. Amen. All right, we're going to get started with some praise and worship. Uh, so we're going to ask Sister Precious Michael to take the helm at this time and lead us in that. Let's say amen for her. Amen. amen. We bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, the psalmist said, and all that is within me. What has he done? He's healing all my diseases. So I say, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together.
Here's the 
So good to be in God's house again today. I um, want to welcome you all here. Good to see you all. Amen. Nice crowd today. Amen. 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 Um, we have a couple of announcements, some acknowledgments we need to make before we get to the word. We want to pray, obviously, and we'll remind you of your giving. Um, uh, but before we do any of that, because it's first Sunday, I want to give a chance for acknowledgments of uh, birthdays, although we don't have them on record. Raise your hand. We don't want to overlook anybody. Deacon Andre Smith. Amen. Amen. What's, what, what day? 15. Tax. Well, it used to be tax day. I don't know what tax day. Amen. <laughs> they moved it so many times since October. Amen. But we thank God for our minister, Andre Smith. I had two sayings, so I remember to say it. Amen. Who had his first sermon last uh, Sunday and, uh, and blessed us richly. So happy birthday to you, my brother. Amen. And to all of you who observe a birthday this month. Um, and speaking of last Sunday, we're just so thankful for all who helped make last Sunday happen. Of course, it started in the morning with Sister Anetta Johnson and Sister uh, Deaconess uh, Sylvia Ware working together to... Uh, produced that beautiful service and then the sumptuous meal that followed. I believe Sister Susan made a special donation, so I want to make sure I acknowledge that. I found that out later. Yeah. Amen. So thank her for that, for them all making their valuable uh, contributions for the family and the friends who came out. We were grateful for all of it. Amen. And then that afternoon, after that wonderful meal and high time with the Lord in the morning, um, we had uh, the maiden sermon for Minister Andre Smith. Uh, I believe all the churches were represented at that service. Amen. So I'm very grateful for that. Amen. God bless them. He got a really strong start. I'm, Amen. Uh, I'm excited about where you start. Amen. Because that means you're only going up from there. And that's a wonderful place to be. Amen. Amen. And while I'm saying that, as I look around, we are blessed. Amen. And I think God knew what I needed this Sunday. I needed to see y'all's faces. Amen. Not just hear your voices or see your names on the screen. <laughs> Amen. So I'm glad that you're here. It encourages my heart. Um, and for those of you who can't be here or who are not here, you are no less than. I'm um, talking about what I need this morning. Um, so uh, I'm looking around the crowd here. We've got, uh, uh, we got Minister Sherry Gamble, who has multiple homes in the United States, and she's spending time with this one today. It makes you sound wealthy, doesn't it? <laughs> That's because you are. You're rich enough. Amen. Uh, so good to have you with us today. I pray that your trip was uh, was uh, fruitful and had a great time with family as well as the entire Moran family. Great to have all of you all back. And then reasonable health. Amen. <laughs> I'm looking around. I see Minister Sherry Gamble. I see, of course, Minister uh, Smith. Who I just mentioned, I see Minister Lamont Benjamin. Good to have you with us. He led us off in prayer this morning. Always grateful for that. Amen. Uh, of course, we have our very able and faithful uh, assistant pastor, Amen. Pastor Willie Witt. Good to have him here. Amen. Amen. That's your ministerial staff. Oh, and me too. But that's your ministerial staff. Amen. And that's that's a beautiful thing. Now let me tell you, man. If, if you all only knew what was happening in the church across this country, you'd know how blessed we are. We're we're small, but we're pretty we're pretty mighty. Amen. And we got stuff others wish they had. They may have more members, but they don't have as many faithful people. And so I'm just grateful for that. I just want to acknowledge that today. I'm looking around at all of you. You're not on the ministry staff. I look at my um, brother Turner, brother Drew Turner, Andrew Turner. Who was our newest deacon in training? Amen. We we have one brother move into the ministry and another brother move into the diaconate. So, yeah, God knows what we need. He's been faithful since they've been members here, as well as his beautiful wife who said, "Pastor, I'm an usher." Amen. So we we gonna make that happen too. Amen. Just know we're still looking for some deaconesses. Hint hint. Wink wink. Um, 
uh, we're, we're looking for folks to fill all the ministry in the house. And then, of course, we want to get back in a position where we're able to do ministry outside of the house again. Safely, but we still need to do it because it's a world that's dying and needs to hear this gospel outside of these walls. Amen. Amen. So we pray God's guidance on how to consistently and creatively do that. Amen. Amen. Um, as, as I'm saying that, again, good to see all of you. Um, and I'm expecting, I know, I, I know for a fact, others of you are uh, beginning to transition into other parts of ministry. So I look forward to making those multiple announcements in the future. But until then, just know that all of you, as God calls you to something, forget about titles, forget about established offices in the church. When God says, I want you to do this thing, even if you can't associate that with something you see around you, just let me know. And we will find, make, steal a place for you. Amen? There is no shortage of work, just a shortage of workers. So, amen. We are looking forward to that. Uh, and on that note, uh, we have a council that met this past, I think it was Wednesday, maybe? Wednesday? Um, a council of seven, who, and I, I said in a, our last business meeting, in fact, the last two business meetings, I said I wanted to draw together a council to talk about what to do, certainly with our physical facilities, to make sure that another generation of Bethelites can enjoy it. And so that council met for the first time this past Wednesday. Uh, the council will meet again uh, the third Sunday after service and begin its work in earnest as far as figuring out what our, our, our needs are. Um, they are operating along with our two existing trustees uh, as a trustees council to make uh, recommendations to you, the body, about uh, things that need to happen. So, and I probably shouldn't try to do this, but I will try. On that council is our assistant pastor, Elder Willie Witt, um, Sister Deaconess, uh, excuse me, Deaconess Sylvia Ware, who's our church clerk, Sister Angela Borden, who's our church's financial secretary, um, Sister Precious Michael, who's also our musician, Minister, uh, Minister Andre Smith, Minister Lamont Benjamin, and Sister, you know, I'm missing one person. Thank you, Sister Gwen Jordan, are the seven people on that uh, particular council. So any one of them you can approach if you've observed something or you have a question or a suggestion about things that need to happen here around our physical asset, which is the building of this church, amen? So we're excited about that because that means that uh, we can revitalize our environment to make it more uh, attractive and accommodating for our worship and our service. So I'm really excited about that. Um, all right, so, so much for that. As far as announcements, I know that, uh, our belief that Macedonia has a, an anniversary this month. Does that sound right to anybody? I haven't seen you. Toward the end of the month. Toward the end of the month. So just keep that in mind and we'll get you an exact date. Um, but I know that typically in April they have an anniversary service. Uh, and I believe it's going to be their church anniversary service. Amen. This Friday, there is a Good Friday service. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's at the Mount Olive Church of Christ Holiness. Does that sound right? At 7 o'clock. 7 p.m.? Yeah. All right. So uh, it's an ACLCH event at the Mount Olive Church of Christ Holiness um, at 7 p.m. So it's the seven last words of Jesus Christ. The seven last words. And I believe each one has been assigned a speaker. Amen? So we ask that you support that. Um, as far as announcements, I believe that's all I have. Someone let me know if I'm Say it again. Thank you. <laughs> I probably should announce the sunrise service. Didn't I? Um, this coming Sunday, we're going to change things up. Now, I need you all's help in this. Because obviously I'm making this announcement now. We only have a week to go. So I need you all's help to contact people who aren't on our teleconference, live stream, or in the, in the sanctuary your family and your friends. We are going to have sunrise service at 6 p.m. 6 a.m. 6 a.m. I need one more hour of sleep this morning. 6 a.m. Um, and that's a resumption because I don't think we've had that service since prior to COVID. 
So this is a resumption of that service. We've had it for years, so we're going to start having it again, 6 a.m. And as tradition has been, after that 6 a.m. service, after that 6 a.m. service, that sunrise service, the brothers will have prepared for us a breakfast. So we'll go right down into the dining hall and we will feast on breakfast together. And of course, that 6 a.m. service is a time to theoretically observe um, uh, the rising of Jesus Christ early in the morning. So that's why we do that. Okay. So that sunrise service, 6 a.m., breakfast right after. And then shortly after that, we'll have Sunday school, um, which typically starts at 9.30. And then that's it for the day. We're done. So if you come to church at 11 a.m. next Sunday, make sure the gates are locked before you leave. Because <laughs> we'll be gone, more than likely. Amen. Or we'll be leaving at least at that point. So no, no, no 11 a.m. service next Sunday. No 11 a.m. service. So please share that with others, uh, especially those who don't come as often. Make sure they know. And I'll try to make that announcement again uh, on Wednesday during Bible study and post it on Facebook. Amen? All right. I think we've gotten everything now. Praise the Lord. All right. I want to remind you of your giving this uh, Sunday. Zelle Venmo uh, Cash App mailing your gift to the church. This would be a great time to do it. That way you don't forget. Some of you, because we are giving more digitally now, some of you are starting to give even, uh, you know, we get it throughout the week prior to Sunday. That's fine too. Just make sure you get that gift in. I will say of the church that generally speaking, your giving has not slacked off. Yes. The Macedonia pastor's anniversary is April 23rd at 3.30 in the afternoon. That's our 4th Sunday. So Macedonia, 4th Sunday, April 23rd, 3.30 p.m. Uh, church anniversary service. Amen for Macedonia Church of Christ. Yeah. And I was saying your giving hasn't given, hasn't really slacked off during COVID. Um, if anything, it's a little better than it used to be. Um, and I think because it's a little more convenient for people to give who aren't here. Amen. So thank the Lord for Zell, Venmo, and Cash Out. And I wish I would have did a long time ago. <laughs> uh, but we're doing it now, so we are grateful. That said, not everybody gives. So make sure that you worship the Lord in your giving. Amen? And then finally, uh, prayer. Of course, we have those on our, our, uh, our sick list, our constant prayer list. Uh, folks like Mother Woodson is on there now as she is in rehab. Uh, Sister Bethune Johnson has been on there for quite some time. My mother-in-law, uh, Grace Rice, is on there. Deaconess Korea Staten is on that list. Um, Sister Frances Gamble, which is the mother of our own uh, church clerk, Deaconess Ware, is on that list. And there are so many others. Let us remember to call them out in our individual prayers as we pray. And uh, for those of you who are aware of others who are in some way distressed. It doesn't have to be physical sickness. Anything for which they are in need of God's intervention, make sure you call those out in your prayer time too. And even when we go to prayer right now, you can whisper their names in prayer. Something very special happens when two or three are gathered together as touching on any one thing. God promises special visitation. So why not take advantage of that? One of the ways we take advantage of that is we come together in prayer in this way. And we magnify the force of one another's prayers. That's a wonderful thing. Now, that should excite you because you might have a need right now. And what I'm saying right now is call it out while you have all of us here. Call it out and watch God show up at the point of your need. Amen? Amen. All right. We're going to go to prayer just now. Would you bow with me? Father, I thank you for your loving kindness and your grace, your tender mercies towards us. We are here in this house called by your name because of your great love towards us. God, you love us. We know you love us. We know you love us because you gave your son to die for our sins. What an awful death that was. But also there was victory and that he conquered death. He got up out of the grave. He rose and he lives. We know you love us. But we also know you love us because of the current state of our affairs. We had food this morning, we had clothes this morning, we had shelter this morning, we have a reasonable portion of health this morning. 
We have people in our lives that we love and people who love us this morning. We are wealthy today. And that's because you love us. Your love is not just an expression of your sentiment, but it's expressed in your actions and your behaviors toward us. You love us so much that while we were yet sinners, you sent your son to die for us. And he loved us so much that he gave his life for us then took it back up again for us. So we thank you, God. And as we are here in this house called by your name, calling on your name and declaring your name for all to hear, we pray you would be among us today. Renew our strength. Give us courage. Clarity of faith. Direction. Renew our hope. Bestow upon us peace. Fill us with joy. And with love. And where we are not in alignment with your will, where we have sinned, missed the mark, fallen short, failed, offended you, neglected, disobeyed you. God, we pray you would forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of unrighteousness. We know that you can and we believe that you will. You forgive us. Thank you, God. Now help us to turn around face you and walk according to the steps that you have ordered as we draw near to you. In Jesus name. There are names we are calling out even now. Right now we are calling out names. We are calling out conditions. We are calling out situations. God we see you moving in a miraculous way. We see your anointing falling fresh on our lives and the lives of others and the lives of our ministry and the ministries of others. God, we see your spirit coursing throughout our communities to manifest your will and you're using us to do that. And we're grateful. Thank you. God, you've bestowed power upon yeah. us. Power to loose and power to bind. Thank you, Lord. Power to forgive. Yes. Power to love. Hallelujah. And we thank you for that. Thank you, Lord. God, use us for your glory. Yes, Lord. Use us for your glory. Yes, Lord. That your name might be lifted up. Hallelujah. Draw the lost to yourself. Thank you. Empower us to be the light that you called us yes, to be. Yes, Lord. The salt that you called us to be. Yes, Lord. A purging and preserving effect on the earth. Yes. God, have your way. Thank you, Lord. Show yourself strong to us. Yes. Show yourself strong through us. Thank you, Lord. Receive the meditations of our hearts. Hallelujah. The words of our lips. May they be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yes, Lord. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask that you turn your Bibles to the book of Mark. Lord. Chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. We're going to look at verses 9 through 16 specifically. But the context is actually chapters 11 through 16. But we're looking at verses 9 through 16 specifically, the gospel according to Mark. And today's vada is the kinds of followers of Christ. The kinds of followers of Christ. Amen. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 16. Let's say amen for Sister Precious Michael as she comes at this time. Amen. Thank uh -huh. 
So you sacrificed your life so I could be free, so I could be whole, and I would tell everyone I know you thought I was worth saving. So you So you sacrificed your life so I could be free, so I could be whole, and I would tell everyone I seen by her uh, they would not believe it after these things he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into uh, the country they went back and told to the rest but they did not believe him believe them afterward he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. The Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. We uh, 
pull from this text something about the um, the character of what it means to quote unquote follow Christ. What does that mean? What does it mean to follow Christ? And from the scripture, we can sort of discern that and I believe the Spirit's move this morning is for us to be able to examine our own lives and the quality of our discipleship so that we avoid some of the traps that those in Jesus' day fell into headlong. The kinds of traps that disallowed them from being true disciples. Today we would say it that way. Today we say real Christians. Right? When you talk about real Christians, right? But when you, even when we use that phrase, it, it glosses over what, what we are actually to be. And that's disciples of Jesus Christ. Right. A disciple is not just a follower. Because in a moment, I'm going to show you that Christ had lots of different kinds of followers. Right. But it's the discipline with which you follow. What are the rules? What are the standards? What is the guidelines for you adhering to someone's teaching? How do you develop behaviors and practices? Your ethical being, how do you as a person come into your personality based on the one that you are following? We all mimic somebody. And don't for a moment think you don't. There are so many things about you that are like your mom and your daddy. It ain't even funny. And much of that you don't even recognize. I've always found it very compelling the fact that I can meet somebody who never knew one of their parents. And yet they're just like them. Their mannerisms are just like them. I've even found that sometimes their mentalities. What is that? You ever thought about that? What is that? What is that that we transfer to our children that is that is uh, so enduring, so hardy, that without any of our interventions, without our influence, they're just parts of us in our children. We're obstinate. They're obstinate. Right? I'm a jokester. Y'all don't know that. So are my children. I did a DNA test recently and found out that the tribe that my father comes from, this is between 500 and uh, 1,000 years ago, is a joking tribe. And they joke just the way I joke. People say, Carnell, people who call me Carnell. Y'all don't feel comfortable doing that, but that's okay. There are people in the world who call me Carnell. Um, they say, Carnell, man, your, your, your humor is biting. That stuff is dry, but it's biting. I was so happy to be able to tell people it's in my DNA. My, my people have been doing this a thousand years. <laughs> it's amazing how that works, though. How that gets passed down from generation to generation. And so we are influential in ways we can't even begin to understand. There is a mystery. There is a mystery to my personhood, who I am as a person, to some degree I can understand it. To some degree I can understand why I think the things I think and believe the things I believe, but a lot of that's shrouded in mystery. There are parts of me that I don't altogether understand. And I've preached to you year after year, we're going into 22 years of this, I've preached to you year after year, all of us should self-audit on a regular basis. Why do I do the things I do? Why do I say the things I say? Why do I believe the things I believe? Why do I react to situations the way I do? And is it godly? Is it healthy? Is it righteous? We all should be asking those questions on an ongoing basis. But I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes when I ask myself that question, I don't have the why. I just do it. I'm hypercritical because I am. I just am. And so then, because I know that, 
one of the ways that I can combat that is to be mindful of that behavior and where it comes from. To be mindful of that behavior and where it comes from. And to understand that one of the functions of the Holy Ghost in my life, I'm going to get to the text in a moment, but one of the functions of the Holy Ghost in my life is to bring to me this thing called temperance, for those of you who are KJV users. In other versions, it's simply put self-control. There's a, there's a selfhood. There's, a, there's the self that I am. But I cannot just say I'm this way because I'm this way and therefore it excuses every crazy thing I do. It doesn't work that way. God has filled me with this Holy Spirit so I can control my self. Thank you, Lord. And not allow myself to express its way, to express itself in a way that is ungodly. Y'all gonna get that on the way home. And so what I come to this morning is the question of who am I as a follower of Christ? Who am I? Because this really is about identifying not who I am in some abstract and philosophical way. No, in a real way. Who am I as a follower of Christ? Who am I? How do, how do I observe my discipleship? How can you look at me from the outside and see that I'm a disciple of Christ? What am I doing? How am I behaving? How am I talking? that demonstrates that I follow Christ as a disciple. Because not everybody that follows Christ is a true disciple of Christ. Y'all with me? Right. Let's look at the text and see what we find. Y'all ready? Yep. There are four models of following Christ that I find at the cross. This is the week of the Passion. Where all throughout the week we'll, we will observe the last days of Jesus Christ on the earth. He starts this week with hails of Hosanna as he enters into Jerusalem for the final time. It is now and here that he will meet his physical end. Go with me. And it's also here where all of the different people who have followed him for all of the different reasons for these last three plus years will all come together for this grand final event that we call the crucifixion. Who are they? Well, I want to submit to you that we have three types of disciples on the scene and then this other group that also follow. There are the emotional disciples. There are the spiritless disciples. There are the scholars who are not really disciples at all, but they still follow Christ. And then there are the true disciples. Emotional disciples, spiritless disciples, the scholars, and the true disciples. Pastor Gordon, where did you find the emotional disciples? They're all here in Mark. I'm repping my brother Mark this morning because I don't think he gets the respect he deserves. When we preach from the Bible, there are certain texts we preach from a lot and certain texts we preach from a little. Mark is in the latter. Mark is like a weak version of Matthew for most people. Most people will say, anything I get from Mark, I get from Matthew, and I can get it better. More details, more descriptive. But I like the language of Mark. See, it's Mark who says of Christ in the wilderness, he was driven right. into the wilderness. Yes. So I think his gospel has a place in helping us understand the heart of the matter and not just chronicle what happens. So I like Mark. Mark says in chapter 11, verses 4 through 10, Mark chapter 11, Amen. Starting at verse 11, again, this is the English Standard Version of the Bible. And he said, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed 
see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be given. Chapter 14, excuse me, that's Mark 4, it's the wrong one. Chapter 11. What verse did I say? Uh, here you go. Mark 11. I'm going to start at uh, verse 7. And they brought the colt to Jesus who had asked for it. He had told his disciples to go into town and find a man who has a colt. They did that. And they brought the colt to Jesus, verse 7, chapter 11, Mark 11, 7. And threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches. That's the palm fronds that we often see on this day. That they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting. What were they shouting? Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 10. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. What a wonderful scene we see there of the folks who are uh, congregating for this high feast season in Jerusalem and who hear that Jesus is coming into the city. We've preached other sermons where we talked about how he was coming uh, into the back gate of the city and he was met by these people throwing fronds, uh, palm fronds at his feet. And they were worshiping and they were praising. But here's the problem. Just a few days later, these are going to be some of the same people crying, crucify him, crucify him. How do you explain that within literally a matter of hours, the sentiment of people can change so radically? How, can you, how do you explain people being for you and then being against you? In the span of a breath. Well, one thing I believe explains this is the power of emotions. It's the power of emotions. See, I'm convinced that a lot of people know just enough about Jesus to want to tap into his power, but don't know a whole lot about his purpose. And so we can get excited about his power. Think about this. Here is a man who, when you were hungry, could just make food appear. Here is a man that, when not a doctor in the land could help you, could make you see again, could make you walk again. Here's a man who could bring your daughter back to you or your brother back to you. That kind of power is compelling. And whether we want to admit it or not, all of us like to be close to power. Folks who have access, who can get things done straightway, who can help us be more effective, who can help us attain, acquire, and achieve. It's great to have folks like that in your circle. It's great to have those phone numbers on your phone. So that when you need something, you can cut through the system and go straight to the top and get it done. Isn't that wonderful? Man. So let's not pretend like we don't understand that. And how excited do we get when we're in the presence of power? Especially when the occasion allows us to network with that power and pull that power close to us so that we can use it when we have to. We're in the United States of America. We're absolutely enamored by power. We love powerful people. We write books about them and articles about them. We make TV shows and movies about them. We celebrate them. We hold them up as models of what we all want to aspire to be, only on the force that they have power. Economic power. Political power. Social power. I'm looking at Jesus and I'm seeing a man who has power. Look at all these people following him. He must be somebody. Let me get in this line right here. Come on now. The, 
problem with being enamored by power when it isn't married to purpose is it becomes poison. And we have this amazing way that when power doesn't work for us, we automatically think it's working against us. We're simplistic beings in that way. Either do what I need you to do or you're in my way. And the one thing that you and I have to reckon about Christ is he doesn't always do what we want him to do. Lord knows he doesn't always do what we want him to do. And while we may say out of our mouths that his judgments are perfect, we don't always think that. So imagine being these people on this day and you're watching this man with all this power let himself be whipped all night. No, first he let himself be arrested. Then he let himself be whipped all night and mocked with cruelty. Then he let himself be hanged. How much power can you have if you can't, and the words rang out, save yourself? And because we didn't understand his purpose, we judged unrighteously his power and turned on him. And notice that when I say that to you, I don't say they, I say we. Because it's reflective of human nature that when we don't understand things, we reject them. So while my behavior towards Christ may not exactly be like this, Every time I doubt that he means only the best for me, every time I doubt that he's there for me, every time I doubt that he controls my outcomes, how am I not them? How am I not the emotional disciple? I get excited about Jesus to the extent that I can see him working. But the moment Jesus ghosts me, I ghost him. The moment I can't see him in my situation, he won't be seeing me. Because if you won't do it, Lord, I'll do it for myself. In fact, you in the way now. Emotional discipleship. It describes our behaviors when we're hot about God and then we're not about God. It describes our relationships with one day we're in the church saying, I'll die for him, I'll live for him, I'll go anywhere he tells me to go, I'll say anything he says to me. Tells me to say, and he tells me to go somewhere, and I'm like, now? He tells me to say something, and I'm like, me? It's emotional discipleship. I only do those things I can feel. If I'm excited about it, then it's legitimate. If I'm not excited about it, how legitimate can it really be? Emotional discipleship. They knew enough about Christ to know his power, but not enough about Christ. To know his purpose. Number two is the spiritless discipleship. Just the way the Hosanna crowd followed him because of the promise of finally having their messianic deliverer from the oppression of Rome, there was this other group that we simply refer to as the disciples. Who it is written of in scripture, in Mark chapter 14, verse 50. Very brief verse, it says, And they all left him and fled. And they all left him and fled. Who? His disciples. He was now fully experiencing his persecution, which would lead to prosecution, which would lead to death. And that was a little bit more than they could handle. So the scripture says, they all left him and fled. As if to say this wasn't some incidental leaving. It's not like they wandered off to get things done and in the ensuing time he was arrested. No, they left him because he was arrested. They were running from his adversities. 
They were running from his persecution. They were running from his prosecution. They were running from him. This is just after that blessed time of communion, which we will partake of today. This is after that time he spent in the garden, petitioning the father, pleading with him, no less than three times. He now sees this remnant that have been his followers for so long, for really the entirety of his earthly ministry, and at this hour, they were leaving him. How many know what it feels like when you really need people? They're not there. How many of you know what it really feels like when you meet people and they're not there just not because they happen to be elsewhere occupied, but intentionally they are not answering the phone. Intentionally they are not responding to your calls because they don't have nothing to do with what you're going through. That's where our Christ was. These were spiritless disciples as opposed to spirit filled disciples. What kind of followers would this be? They know enough about Jesus to celebrate the holidays. But while they're observing the traditions, they haven't really learned to enjoy the relationship. Here's what we may sometimes fail to realize when we read the scriptures, and especially the Gospels. The disciples, the entire time they were with Christ in his earthly ministry, struggled with faith. The entire time. The times we see it are the times when adversity hits. Remember when Christ is fast asleep on the ship, the body, uh, the Bible says he, had, he was really tired, so he went below and they fashioned out of clothes a pillow for him to lay his head on and he was trying to get some rest. And remember the storm comes in and the ship starts to take on water and uh, a couple of them run down there and say, uh, Master cares not thou that we perish. Remember that? That's one example of how in times of adversity they forgot who they were, who he was, and what that relationship meant. By now they should have known that while Christ had an end on this earth, that wasn't it. They should have known that his purpose was not yet completed. And yet during the adversity, they forgot all about that, only thinking about self-preservation. They accused him of not caring, of not being mindful about their safety and their care. How is that possible? Can I just say to everybody in the room, we need to stop expecting people that we don't have strong relationships with to understand us in any way. If you don't have a healthy relationship with somebody, they don't get you, and the reality is you don't get them either. You only know me when I let you know me. Some of you, I haven't let you know me. It is what it is. Because you can't trust everybody with everything. There's a reason why when Christ goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, he leaves them folks at the gate. Because I'm about to say something to God that I know if you heard me say that, y'all trip. You trip. It's okay if a few hundred years from now you read in the Bible, I say, if there be any way, let this bitter cup pass from me. But you can't hear that in real time. Because if you hear that in real time, you're going to forget about everything else I said. Yeah. So our relationship is going to exist on the plane of things we do in common. It has to be structured. We have a reason for being together. We don't just hang out. <laughs> and all the disciples had known was the agenda of Christ in their life. That's all they had known was the agenda of Christ. Now, he had a certain intimacy with them. Remember, he says to them at one point, I don't treat you like slaves, I treat you like friends. Because with slaves, the, the, the servant has to do what the master says do, and the master doesn't have to explain. He says, but I tell you everything the father tells me. Yeah. Right. So there is a level of intimacy, but that's with respect to the father's plan. Don't get it twisted. Right. 
in a very real way, you don't understand Christ the man. And the complexity that that is. And the contradictions that even existed in the Messiah. It is a contradiction to know that you are born to give your life. And then at the last minute say, can we change this up? Literally, he says, if there be any other way. It's a contradiction. And here we are, about 2,000 years later, in the halls of universities across the world, still debating what it means. There is no need to debate. When you know they are going to drive nails through your feet and through your hands, you too will say to God, is there any other way? We've even romanticized it to say, well, he didn't want to leave his disciples. He wasn't leaving his disciples. He was transforming so he could ever be with his disciples. No, wrong, try again. He did not want the nails in his feet. He did not want the nails in his hands. But the thing he wanted most was to do the will of his father so he gets to a point in the prayer where he says, nevertheless, They don't get it. So when it all went down the way it was supposed to, because they don't get it, they left him and fled. And how many times in my life, can't speak for you, you can only speak for me. How many times in my life, when things went sideways, I judged God as being de derelict and absent in my situation. So I went my way. How many times have I made that decision? God, you don't want me? I don't want you either. You're not going to be with me? I'm not going to be with you. You're not going to serve me? I'm not going to serve you. Can't speak for you. You don't speak for me. How many times have I looked at God and said, this don't make no sense. I'm not comfortable saying you're wrong, God, but I'm not comfortable saying you didn't get this one right, but I'm not comfortable saying you were late, but I think of Mary and Martha. Had you gotten here sooner, our brother would still be alive. What's the implication? You were late. There you go, always having to stop and help people. Got to help everybody. I can hear it now in my head. I can hear her saying in her mind, you don't always have to stop and help everybody. This was your friend. You should have made him a priority. And then you were out there healing the blind and raising the dead. And now you got a friend that's dead here. And now we can't do nothing. Yeah, I know we'll see him in the resurrection, but I don't see him now. And I want him now. How many times have I had those conversations with God? I'm tired of the future comfort. I'm tired of the in heaven thing. There's some things I want now. I want some relief now. I want some help now. And God, you keep not showing up now and everybody talking about then. I'm hurting right now. I'm in need right now. I'm struggling right now. I'm suffering now. So God, do something now. And if you're not going to do it now, then are you really who I think you are? So they left and fled. Would you, would you flee if you knew that you were serving the king of the universe? Would you, would you flee if you knew that someone was serving out their divine purpose in life and rather than helping them do that, you just leave? Do you not understand the implications of them leaving? Did they truly believe? They were spiritless disciples. By the way, spiritless is a synonym for cowardly. And the Bible says that God takes no pleasure in a drawback spirit. Sometimes we draw back. Because we're scared to engage life. That's a spiritless discipleship. And that's not what we've been called to. No weapon formed against me. And everything you say secretly about me will be judged in public. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Different sermon. Number three. We 
got the emotional disciples. It only works when it works. We got the spiritless disciple. It only works when it's convenient. Then we got the scholars. They are followers, but I wouldn't call them disciples. This is your theological crowd. This is these are your chief priests, your scribes, your elders. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. I'm going to look at the first two verses. And then verses 60 through 65. Mark chapter 14. It was now two days before the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. Go to verse 60. In verse 60 it says, Mark 14, 60 says, And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? Right? They're trying him at this point. Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. I am. Man, that's bold. I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Verse 63. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him and deserving, as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. They beat him before they beat him. They beat him. They beat him before they whipped him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Some people follow Jesus for the intellectual engagement. They will call themselves Christians, but they're not sure of the deity of Christ. They are not sure how much God intervenes in the affairs of men on a regular basis. In fact, they're not sure of anything. The only thing they're sure of is that their purpose in the world is to study God. And so their religion is knowledge. They can talk to you all about the assembly of the different versions of the Bible, the incompatibility of those versions, the history of how they came about, how they were preserved. They can talk to you about the historical meaning that's been gleaned from these scriptures. They can talk to you about the geopolitical realities when these scriptures were written. They can talk to you about the cultures that produce these scriptures and the men that wrote them and what their motivations may or may not have been. But they don't really know nothing about Jesus. They're just that. They're scholars. And I don't have a problem with scholarship. I am a scholar. But they were studying and not learning. And that's not good scholarship. Because to really to pursue an understanding of God, you'll get one. God don't play hide and seek. In fact, the scripture tells us, if you seek, if God plays hide and seek, he plays it the way you, you play with minor children. You hide in plain sight. You tell them to cover their eyes and count to ten. When they finish counting, they can count to ten, count to five, whatever. They turn around, here you are, facing the corner. Right there. All they had to do was seek. And that's the simplicity of what it means to have a relationship with God. The more you look for me, the more of me you will see. Because I want you to find me. I want you to know me. I want you to understand my heart. Because I want you to have my heart. So I am discoverable. I am observable. If that is truly your goal, but if your goal is to dispute and investigate 
and examine, and that's really the, the aim of your religion. It is not to know, but to develop more interesting questions, which is what scholars do. We develop questions, and then we set up experiments to try to answer those questions. And then when we've answered that question, the experiment yields yet another question, and then we pursue that question. We're not necessarily always trying to understand the larger phenomenon. We just like to ask questions. Sometimes the government gives us grants to do that, so we have money. Sometimes we can write papers about that. Sometimes we sit around in a circle and we have interesting conversations about that. Sometimes those conversations are televised. We make a lot of money doing this. People hire us to consult their businesses because we're great at asking questions and coming up with ways to answer questions. But we never quite learn stuff. We just find that there are more and more questions. And in today's church, there are lots of questions. Did Jesus really exist? These are things churches ask. Or is he a metaphor for something greater? Is Jesus equal to the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit equal to God? Are they all equal to each other? Was there an earth before this earth? Will there be an earth after this earth? Where is heaven? Does it exist now? Can we see it through a telescope? Interesting question, but none of them are helping us learn who God is. Yes. And that's what the scholars were. That's what the, the chief priests were. That's who the scribes were. That's who the Pharisees are. And that's who we are. When we fail to heed Paul's admonition, that we don't just get into faith so that we can engage in what the King James Version calls doubtful disputations. I, I don't want to just do this so I can have arguments with Muslims about whose God is better. <laughs> I want to know God. Through his son Jesus Christ. I want to have fellowship with that suffering. Because it's through that suffering. That I draw closer to God. And while that may seem strange to you. It's just because you haven't gotten to a point in your faith. Where you understand the role of suffering. But it forges, forges in us a character. That we will not otherwise have. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Because part of the making of Christ is the bruising of Christ. One of the things we have to reconcile ourselves with is that the scripture tells us that even Christ was perfected throughout his life. He was made more complete. He was more fully realized as he got older and more experienced. That is the nature of humanity. The stuff we go through makes us. But if we're not learning life's lessons and applying those lessons to live more skillfully, then we'll study a lot of stuff and never learn anything. That's not discipleship. That's being a professional student. Then the last group, and I promise you I'm finished. It went way longer than I expected. It's true discipleship. Mark 15, verses 40 and 41. This is it. Mark 15, verses 40 and 41. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger of Joses and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. True di discipleship is to follow wherever Christ leads. Amen. To know enough about Jesus to give them our lives. And while the scripture we just read said that in prior times they had ministered to him, they were now distant from him and couldn't do so. He was their ministry. And at this point, they couldn't get close enough to him to do what they had historically done. But that's okay. They still showed up where he was. To give Christ my whole life 
means not just giving him my public ministry. I need especially preachers to hear that. My discipleship, the strength of it and the quality of it, is not rooted in preaching the gospel. It's just not. I am not defined as a person by being a pastor or a bishop or whatever other title the church deems to give me. I can I cannot be those things. I can hang up those shingles tomorrow. And I'm still a disciple of Jesus Christ. Those are just offices. They're functions. They're tasks. And the one trap I can't fall into is only studying the Bible so I can minister what I study. There has to be that time I spend searching the scripture to draw closer to the Lord. There are things I know about scripture that I've never preached on. They're not for a sermon. They're for me. Not everything's for a sermon. Some stuff's just for me. How many of you ever made a meal just for yourself? Versus making a meal for the whole family. There are times now where I just make a, a bowl of double for myself. Amen. Amen. I just... Just enough shrimp, just enough sausage, just enough rice, just enough room for me. Nicholas will come to the house, we can refrigerate and see the gumbo, but that's my gumbo. Come on, put your hands on We can't just minister as the public face of our discipleship. We can't just praise as the public face of our relationship. Hosanna, Hosanna, crucify him, crucify him. It's easy to make that transition when it wasn't real in the first place. Amen. I'm trying to wrap up because I know we have to do communion, but let me just say this. This, this came to me while I was reading this, uh, Minister Gamble. I spent the first, I don't know, five, maybe even ten years of being a minister thinking that part of my job was to cheerlead the church. So no matter what they asked me to do, when I got up, I always felt like if the crowd was like this, kind of quiet, the first thing I had to do was give God some praise. Come on, get on your feet and clap my hand. And then I realized that's not my job. It's not my job. It's not my job to get you excited about God. Because even if I do, you're going to do what I said do because of peer pressure. You don't want to be the only person sitting down when everybody else standing up. <laughs> How do you think you can? Praise God. But if, if I don't have worship in me, the root of which is the W-O-R part, which comes from the word worthy, worth, which means that I have an estimation of the value of God in my life, and my praise arises out of me evaluating how important and relevant God is to my life. So when I Praise is because of who God is to me, and I really don't need you to tell me to clap my hands for my God, and I really don't need you to give me specific uh, instructions on how to express my thankfulness to God, because I truly am thankful, and He is worth a whole lot to me. So just let me do what I do. Stay out of my business. Sometimes all I want to do is just sit there with my head down, cry a little bit. Mm. I shouldn't even go in here, man, because now I'm messed up. I'm so messed up. Y'all ain't know right now. I'm just so messed up. Ah! So messed up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell me how to praise. Make me feel guilty because I'm not making a whole lot of noise. That's what's wrong with you. You just want people to see you. Oh, you're really religious. You anointed. Look at you. Got all in you, hallelujah. Jumping all over the place, falling over the benches, almost hit your head. We got to cover you because you're dripping. Uh. All right. Y'all don't start no more beating. Mm. I give it my life, not just my public praise. I give it my life, not just my private expectations. 
It doesn't matter that I'm standing way out there and he's way in there and I can't touch him and I can't do like I'd, I'd like to do. I can't be as close to him right now as I'd like to be. And there's a barrier between him and I and I don't know how to get past it, but, but he's still my Lord. He's still my Savior and he's still my Jesus and I'm not feeling him right now and hearing him and seeing him the way I'd like to, but I know he is. And as long as he is, I am with him wherever he is. Is. I don't understand everything that's going on. I can't control these outcomes. It's not unfolding the way I'd like it to unfold, but he's still Jesus and I am still who I am. And we still have the same relationship we've always had. The circumstances may be different, more adverse, but he is my Lord and he is my Savior and I believe him. So I'm going to stand right here. I don't know where all this is going, but I'm going to stay right here. Because my personal expectations about how things should play out shouldn't interfere with my relationship when they don't play out that way. I can't be so disappointed that the outcomes aren't exactly what I want them to be that I step out of my fellowship with Christ. That I seek other ways to comfort myself and to get things done. That's what true discipleship is. There's a state of life. I'm going to have to wrap it up there because I want to say so much more, but I'm going, to, I'm going to wrap it up there. There's a state of life that is so difficult. The adults in the room know what I'm talking about. You get to a place in life where you go through some stuff where there are no easy answers. And you get left asking the question, am I doing this right? Sometimes you ask the question, is this happening because I've done something wrong? Did I make some wrong assumptions? But here's what you have to understand. Not everything's about you. Not everything's about me. And there comes a point in my life where all I can do is trust the Lord. I don't have explanations. If you, if you back me in a corner and say, well, why, why does it look this way? I can't tell you. I don't know. Did you do something wrong? Maybe. I, I don't know. Did you make a bad choice? I, I, here's, here's what I do know. I love the Lord. The Lord loves me. And God don't have nothing to prove to me. Not a thing. God doesn't have to give me what I ask for for me to recognize that he's God. Sometimes when I pray, I find myself saying, Lord, it's been a long time now. And this thing hasn't changed. So can you help me see it better? The outcome is what it is. Can you give me a different perspective on it? As I wrap this up in the book of Hebrews, we get excited about those first few verses that talks to us about the heroes of faith. And then you get all of these nameless people who are just lumped in a group. And it is said of them, they never really physically saw the land of promise. They never really got in this life what they wanted. But they laid hands on it by faith. And that's what I'm doing today. There's so many things in my life I'm laying, I'm holding it by faith. I don't have it yet physically manifested, but I'm holding it by faith. My saved children holding on to it by faith. Strained relationships being reconciled, holding on to it by faith. Health adversities being healed, holding on to it by faith. And I declare those things that are not. Father God, I thank you for your loving kindness and your grace towards us today. I see you working in our lives in this, what is most assuredly new season. Get glory, Father, get glory, get glory, get glory, get glory, get glory out of our lives. Draw the lost into yourself. Show yourself strong through us is our prayer yes. in Jesus' name. If you are under the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you come today. It is not my job to convince you or convict you. 
is just to declare that this is your time. And you know right now where you are. If you want to give Jesus Christ your life, have him be your Lord and your Savior. Acknowledge you were born in sin and that the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you want to acknowledge that reality in your life, that you have life eternal through Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let's have you do this prayer of repentance and make that declaration and by faith join the family of God. If that's what you want to have happen in your life, repeat after me in this prayer. My God and my Father, I thank you for your grace. I recognize that I was born in sin. I've committed sin in this life because I haven't always obeyed you. I haven't always acknowledged you. I've lived life on my terms. I repent I'm sorry I made those choices. And I want to follow you, God. I know that Jesus Christ is my Savior because he died for my sins. But he's also my Lord because he rose again, victorious over death. And I know that by spirit, I am led today because you are filling me with that Holy Spirit so that I can communicate with you, Father, and better understand your will. I yield my heart. I give you my heart. I open my heart for you to fill me with your Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, Amen. have your way in my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Yes. You forgive me of my sin. You receive me as your own. Thank you, God. I am saved. I am saved. I am saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you just made that decision, I need you to find somebody in your life right away. Let them know you've made that decision. Ask them to help you find a church home so that you can grow in faith. Let me be the first to say, welcome to the family of faith. Amen. 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 All right, everybody. I want you to get your communion elements now. Raise your hand if you have a need. chapter 11. For I have received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why so many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, chastened, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About other things, I will give directions when I come. Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship, in communion, we are remembering the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. That gift gets celebrated by the world today. But we celebrate it every day because Jesus died for our sins and rose again for our justification. We're glad about it. Thank you for the gift of love. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake of the broken body together by peeling back the plastic top. We're going to do it together. This is the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the same manner, we partake of the cup. This is the New Testament and His blood. Let us drink it together. Amen. We are so glad to have been able to partake of this time of communion with you. We pray that on this week you will be reflective about the gift that is Jesus Christ to the entire world, but also to your life, and that you will bless God and spend time in quiet worship and reflection and meditation with him. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Let's please remember, next Sunday is a modified service schedule. We will be here at 6 a.m., the men will make breakfast for us uh, during that time, immediately following that 6 a.m. sunrise service. We will participate in breakfast together. Uh, we will have Sunday school at 9.30. When Sunday school is over, we will all go our separate way. There will be no 11 a.m., no 11 a.m. service this coming Sunday. God bless you. God keep you. Be well. We're adjourned.